In the following talk, I'd like to address the way in which Christ is present in the law of Moses and in the law of grace under different modalities, according to the mind of St. Thomas Aquinas. And to do that, I'd like to cover three main categories, or three main parts. So we're going to divide this into three sections. The first will deal with Christ's presence in the law of Moses. The second will turn to the, the sort of middle section of the Summa Theologiae and look at the reality of human acts and the way in which sacrifice and religion are dealt with by Aquinas there. And then we'll use some of that material to then talk about the priesthood of Christ in the final and third section of the Summa Theologiae and the way in which that priesthood impacts each one of us, in not only in our participation at Mass and in our reception of the Eucharist, but in, a, in the way in which the sacrament of baptism itself has imprinted something of Christ's priesthood on each one of our hearts. So to begin, perhaps it's helpful just to step back a little bit and speak about the text of the Summa Theologiae as a whole, what, the, what its structure is and its ordering. I think it helps to be able to see how Aquinas is fitting some of these ideas together as part of a larger structure. So the Summa, although it's a pedagogical text, that is a text which is intended as a textbook intended for instruction. It's intended to be read by students, but it's not ordered according to the questions that students might raise themselves. It's ordered according to the order of reality itself. And so the Summa, rather than conforming itself to our order of inquiry, invites us to conform ourselves to the way in which things are, not only according to nature, but according to revelation and grace as well, most especially uh, according to the way in which God has revealed the human person to be in light of the end of beatitude. And so everything that Aquinas does from the beginning until the end of the Summa, although he didn't finish it, he died uh, right during the last part of the Tertia Pars before he was able to finish. But everything he's doing um, in terms of the ratio of the work itself is ordered towards understanding the human person in light of revelation, understanding human acts in light of beatitude, and understanding nature as an image of the Trinity, and the incarnation is the means by which we are caught up once more into the divinizing reality of Trinitarian life, the way in which we find our way home, effectively. So to begin, we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, that Aquinas begins talking about Christ, about Christology, about the Eucharist, and about even the, the foreshadowing of the Christian liturgy and the Mass when he's dealing with the Old Testament in the Prima Secunde, towards the beginning of the Summa. Um, so in the first section here, we're going to talk a little bit about how Christ's priesthood is present in the old law. And in order to get at that, it's helpful first to understand something of what St. Thomas and the Fathers and so many other theologians understand about Scripture itself, is that it has many senses. So you can divide the senses of Scripture into literal and spiritual senses. Literal senses, simply put, are simply what the text says at face value. Um, the words on the page and their immediate meaning within the semantic field normal to those words. That is the dictionary definition of those terms. Now, of course, uh, to understand them in historical context also adds a great deal of depth and meaning to our appreciation of the literal sense of Scripture. But Aquinas is going to say, and he's not that original in this sense, uh, most of the church fathers, almost anyone who's ever read the New Testament is going to say the same, that, that Scripture itself has a kind of polyvalence to it. That is a three-dimensionality or a depth, which is revealed only to the eyes of faith. Uh, so the letters on the page, or the historicity, uh, the literal sense of the text, has a depth beyond itself in which things are signified. Uh, even within Revelation itself, God is already foreshadowing, even in the Old Testament, he's foreshadowing the fullness of Revelation that he intends to accomplish in Jesus Christ. And so Aquinas, again, following the fathers and the medieval uh, the, the theologians of the, the early scholastic period in the high Middle Ages, is going to say that there are spiritual senses of Scripture. And briefly put, he's going to identify um, them in the following way, that you have uh, moral senses of Scripture, right? So senses in which Scripture not only recounts historical events in the literal sense, but has moral implications for human action. Uh, it also has allegorical senses in which it's gesturing towards a future fulfillment. 
And you could also talk about anagogical senses, or ways in which scripture points to the final consummation of all things, to the eschaton, uh, to the final consummation of creation and God's love. And so if we approach scripture with that sense, that understanding that it has a kind of polyvalent quality, or the ability to signify um, different types of realities, particularly when viewed in the eyes of faith, we begin to see something of what St. Thomas himself sees when he reads the Old Testament. And here, as we'll see, once we get into some of his, um, some of his ideas about Christ's priesthood and the Old Law, is that Aquinas is building in part on, on the Venerable Bede and other medieval uh, biblical commentators. And there's also echoes of earlier church fathers like St. Augustine or Origen of Alexandria. Um, so if we turn to the Prima Secundae, so that's the first part of the second part, the Summa has three basic parts, the first, the second, and the third, and the second part has two parts. So that it's the first part of the second part, Prima Secundae, and about question 102, Aquinas is talking about the reality of law. Um, and here he identifies a number of different senses of law. You can talk about natural law, or human law, or divine law. And even within those, there's some further distinctions which don't need to detain us right now. But simply put, law, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the anthropology section of this talk, that's, that's section two. Uh, law can be understood as either an external ordinance, something that someone else ordains that we have to follow, someone with authority, or it can be thought of as a kind of interior principle, um, that is a, a principle which orders a nature and defines it. So what is the definition of human nature? What does it mean? to be a human person, to act rightly as a human person. Law, when spoken of as an interior principle or an intrinsic idea, is really referring to the way in which our nature is defined and ordered, the way it's meant to behave, the way it's meant to act, and the way in which it's going to be perfected also. And so we can speak about different types of law in that sense, natural law and divine law, either as exterior precepts that have been written down by someone, uh, perhaps by Moses in the old law, given by God himself, but also written in the human heart in a sense as well, or, or functioning as a kind of ordering principle interior to human nature itself. Both nature and grace function in that way. Um, they can be spoken of as exterior precepts or a, a, a series of commands or prohibitions, but most fundamentally they can be spoken of right as a, as a law of the heart, as something fundamental to who we are and what we're called to be either according to the, the proportionate end of human nature, which is our natural perfection, or the, you might say, a sort of disproportionate uh, perfection of human nature, which reaches beyond the natural potencies described by Aristotle to access beatitude itself. That's the realm of pure grace, where God's gift perfects us in a way which is, um, it's not foreign to us, uh, and there's a sense in which we were made for it, at least in the mind of God. Um, but there's also a sense in which it is a complete gift. It's not something we could merit or earn, certainly not something we deserve, not something we could accomplish on our own. And so the priesthood of Christ, particularly the instrumentality of Christ's priesthood and our participation in that instrumentality, is going to be our access point, if you will, for a kind of beatified anthropology in the church where we're able to act as human persons in a way which is graced, in a way which reflects the divinizing power of God's love, in a way which animates the whole human soul and all of human society, or the ecclesia, the church, the ecclesia, the gathering of people into the body of Jesus Christ. It animates us all together by the principle of charity. We'll come back to that in the third part of the talk. But all of that's important when we look at the old law, because fundamentally for Aquinas, allegory is the key to understanding Christ's presence in the law of Moses. Now, he'll also speak about the other spiritual senses, anagogy and the moral sense of Scripture, those other spiritual senses of Scripture. But allegory as an idea is something that you can see written in a certain sense into, the, into Scripture itself. If you look at the letter to the Hebrews, for instance, or many, many places in the New Testament, that an allegorical relationship is presumed. Uh, between the new law and the old. That is to say, the old law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The old law is fully understood in Jesus Christ. Um, and so allegory for Aquinas, um, and again, he's building on patristic traditions here, is, um, you might say it's a meaning embedded in the text, only accessible to faith. Uh, it's not so much 
um, a sort of metaphorical extension, right, uh, or something of that kind, or something outside of the text, which the text might possibly imply, you're seeing the fullness of the text when you see Christ there. Okay, so Christ's priesthood and the old law. Um, when we look at the, um, the image of the temple uh, in the old law, we can see a number of different aspects in which there's a sort of allegorical foreshadowing of Christ, his priesthood, and the church, at least according to the mind of St. Thomas Aquinas. So I want to talk about um, the sacrifices of the old law, uh, Holocaust sin offerings and peace offerings, and then we'll look briefly at the physical structure of the temple, and then also the construction of the altar in the temple, and the way in which Aquinas is reading um, some of those texts there. So, okay. Um, so, of the Old Testament sacrifices that Aquinas names, you have some that are holocausts, some that are sin offerings, others are peace offerings. So, a holocaust, in this sense, is a completely consumed offering. That is to say, there's nothing left. It's completely burned up. Um, there, there's no part of it that's reserved. And in this sense, the, the reservation, right, for Aquinas, that distinction between holocausts and other types of offerings under the old law, is significant because in other types of offerings, so sin offerings or peace offerings of that kind, something of the offering is retained, either for the use of the priest who offers it or the use of the, uh, the one who's offering, the one who's making the offering. Now, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It's just the nature of those types of sacrifices that you, you know, uh, something is retained for use. But uh, you know, Aquinas is going to see here not only a distinction in the order of perfection, holocausts are most perfect because they're fully consumed and there's nothing held back. And he'll, he'll liken that to, to Christ himself, but also to those who have been fully perfected in charity, the perfect uh, in the Christian church, or those who are vowed to a state of perfection, like religious, who are bound to, uh, to that end by their vows. Um, but in the other two types of offerings, uh, Aquinas, again, he doesn't see them as deficient just because something's um, less perfect. <laughs> doesn't mean it's, it's intrinsically deficient. Uh, he sees a certain image of, um, of our own humanity and our participation. So I'll come back to that a little bit later. But in the idea of use, uh, sacramental or sacrificial use, um, there's an image here for Aquinas of Christ's embrace of our poverty. Uh, and our humility, uh, of, the, of the humanity which itself is incapable uh, of attaining beatitude according to its own potency, according to its own powers. So um, Aquinas sees um, a certain embrace of poverty, uh, the poverty of the human condition, present in Christ's allegorical presence in the old law and, and in the following way. So even in the case of holocausts, um, there are certain... Um, qualifications um, made for the poor. So it's best to offer a four-footed animal, right? Uh, that's the specification of the law. But there's, um, it's possible if you can't afford that, which might well be the case. It's an expensive gift. Um, you could offer something less, a bird, perhaps. If you can't even offer a bird, if you can't afford a bird, you can offer bread. Uh, and so in that offering of bread, uh, Aquinas sees an allegory of Christ's embrace of our poverty, that his holocaust, Christ's holocaust, his offering of himself, takes the form of the living bread come down from heaven. And in that image, in that obviously Eucharistic and sacramental image, we see something of the way in which Christ approaches our humanity, uh, the way in which he approaches, approaches the frailty of the human condition. Christ's embrace in the incarnation of human suffering, of weakness, of the, of the abject poverty uh, that we find ourselves in. Not only according to nature, not that we could have attained beatitude or any of this on our own authority, uh, but certainly after original sin, there is a deep poverty written into the human story that Christ's incarnational embrace seeks to rectify. And the Eucharist, um, significantly here, is seen as um, a kind of allegory right, of, of that incarnational embrace. It's allegorically present even in the the text of the old law. And so again, in the old law, or anything which contains within it a kind of allegorical meaning, what we mean to say is that in the mind of the divine author of scripture, 
the foreknowledge of God embraces all of these future contingents, all of these ways in which his providence will work itself out over time and history far beyond our understanding. That includes his general providence um, and far more particular plans, like his plan for you and me. And so there's a sense in which, in that image of poverty, which again Aquinas attaches to the image of bread here uh, in the context of the old law, there's a sense in which that image of, of poverty is meant for each one of us as well, um, as a Eucharistic invitation to participate more fully in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so we've talked about Old Testament sacrifices as Holocaust, sin offerings, or peace offerings. We've talked about the image of bread there as a particular type of, of offering, a means of offering in those three forms which has particular Eucharistic significance for, uh, uh, for Aquinas. And again here, um, it's important to note the idea of use. So the fact that we're consuming the bread, right? Uh, there's something that we're doing there. Aquinas will come back to that when he talks about the virtue of religion, the idea of sacrifice, that um, you have Christ's self-offering, his Holocaust. You have sacramental ways, signs by which we participate there's something of, of the, the offering which is used by us, if you will, or consumed in this sense. That's significant for Aquinas. Um, and it should be significant to us, too, because it's a way of validating our liturgical actions, the, the way in which our moral lives participate in the sacramental economy, without attributing um, any undue merit to them, as if we're earning it for ourselves, because we're not. <laughs> um, but at the same time, our participation is important, and it's significant. And as we can see here, it's rooted in the allegorical life of the Old Testament and the Old Law. So let's look a little bit at the, um, the idea of Christ and the, the physical outline of the temple. Now, um, the temple itself um, you know, is constructed in a certain way. right? So you have, um, I don't have a diagram to show you, but um, you have an inner sanctuary separated from the outer, uh, the outer sanctuary by a curtain, and you have uh, the, the further uh, separation of the, there's a sort of outer court where the people will be gathered. Um, so Aquinas is going to use that in a number of different ways. The nice thing about allegory in the spiritual senses of scripture is that they can have more than one meaning. The same text can have multiple spiritual senses, and that's okay uh, because the, the literal sense of the text is the anchor point for the allegory. Um, so Aquinas develops uh, a number of Christological and ecclesial allegories um, by examining the image of the tabernacle and the temple specifically, and, uh, and especially the figure of the high priest, and even his clothing, uh, Aquinas. Again, here he's following the Venerable Bede and some other medieval commentators in, in seeing a, a kind of image almost of the, of the perfection of the church and the clothing of the priest, uh, the high priest. So um, we can... Uh, we can distinguish here uh, between the, the portable tabernacle and the immovable temple. So if you remember from the history of the Old Testament, there was a period before the construction of the Davidic temple in which the tabernacle, which contained the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the law, right, uh, is being carried around in the desert with the people wherever they went. Um, so Aquinas sees a couple different images there. So the figurative significance um, between the, the distinction that is between the portable altar and or the portable tabernacle rather and the immovable temple, um, in one sense signifies the distinction between the old law and the new. So we can simply see there uh, a distinction between type and fulfillment, between the literal sense of the Old Testament and its allegorical fulfillment. Uh, in another sense, the distinction lies within the life of the church itself, between the changeability of the present age and the stability of the church's life in the world to come. Aquinas is going to pick up on that once he moves into the temple and sees Christ as the figure of the high priest entering the sanctuary. Um, in one sense, the division between the, um, the outer court, if you will, and the inner sanctuary. Again, in the, in the stable temple, the temple built uh, in Jerusalem, you have, um, you have the, the tabernacle, or the, co the covenant with the old law, behind the curtain inside, right? And then you have an outer court. And Aquinas will see that distinction as something which lies, sort of the distinction between changeable realities and unchangeable realities. This is an old um, idea in Western philosophy. Um, you can trace it to Plato and others. Um, it's also something embedded in the, in the Christian ethos as well, that uh, there's a distinction between unchanging realities, right? Uh, those things which are invisible, spiritual, unmoving, 
um, and those things which are changing and physical and visible um, and have the characteristics of generation and corruption. They come into being and they go out of being. Now, um, in Aquinas's philosophical world, we can see the distinction right away between God and creation formed along those lines. But even within creation, there's some, you know, you, angels, you don't see them, right? <laughs> uh, but they still um, don't qualify in many ways. I mean, for the, they're still uh, changeable in a sense. Uh, so they're, they're sort of an intermediary maybe. Um, but uh, that, that's a subject for another talk. <laughs> but, um, but so Aquinas sees the, the tabernacle veil, right, as a dividing line between um, spiritual realities and unchanging realities. So for Aquinas, again, this can represent the transition from the old law to the new, from the law of Moses to the law of grace. It can also represent a personal transition uh, which can take place in, the, in anyone's life uh, between a more corporeal understanding of creation and reality um, and a more spiritual one. To return to a theme I mentioned at the beginning when we were talking about the structure of the Summa Theologiae itself, this is something that we can see embedded in the very nature of the text itself. But what is Aquinas trying to do um, when he shows us the data of Revelation, when he shows us how things are, that is, how reality looks when revelation is understood. He's showing us what it looks like when creation is appreciated in light of the unchanging reality of God's love, when we fully understand the mystery uh, that be, that's being revealed to us, and at least as much as we can. Um, reality looks different, uh, and it's because, in a sense, to adopt uh, the metaphor he's using in this text, it's because we've transitioned, at least in part, um, across the veil, across the threshold, to see things through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, one more idea here uh, before we move on to talk about um, law in the New Testament is the idea of the, the altar itself. Now, um, if we focus some attention on the, the altar itself, and you can find this in the book of Exodus, right, chapter 20, uh, the temple altar is not to be constructed of stones or established on high, uh, on some sort of mountaintop or something like that. Um, now, part of this, um, one of the main functions in the, in the literal sense of the old law for Aquinas uh, is the, one of the main functions of the law is to prevent idolatry, right? So having an altar on high, um, on top of a mountain or those sorts of things, or constructed of stones, part of the, the intention here, according to Aquinas, um, is to distance the, um, the mosaic practice from some pagan practices of the time, of that era, right? Uh, but Aquinas sees uh, an allegory here as well, right? Um, so an altar is to be made of earth, right? Um, devoid of ascending steps. So it's more of a bending down than a raising up. Um, and so as truly flesh, Aquinas is going to say, Christ makes an altar of earth in his humanity, which, despite its lowliness, remains co-equal with the Father and without further means of ascent. So the absence of steps is important for, for two reasons. It's important because it represents a full embrace of our lowliness, of our poverty on the part of Christ. That's what the Incarnation is all about. It also means that there's no dignity lost on Christ's part, that he doesn't need the steps, so to speak. He doesn't need to ascend anywhere. He hasn't lost anything of his co-eternity, his co-equality with the Father by the descent, the self-emptying of the incarnation. Um, so the altar itself, which stands at the center of the whole Mosaic liturgy, uh, the place to which the high priest ascends, is also a Christological allegory for Aquinas, and it's an image of the incarnation of Christ's assumption of our flesh. And in it, we can also see the beginnings of the significance of that assumption, what it's going to mean for us, that our very humanity has become a kind of place of sacrifice. Now, um, having said that, I'd like to say a little bit about the anthropology of sacrifice itself before turning to um, some of Aquinas' material in the Tertia Pars in the final section of the Summa. Because if our humanity is meant to be an altar, a place of sacrifice, that means that the anthropological capacity for sacrifice is significant. It's significant for understanding Christ. Um, it's also significant for understanding what's going to happen to us um, in the life of grace and in the new law of love. So, okay. So the whole, um, the secunda pars of the Summa Theologiae uh, 
deals with the moral life, and there are two sections. Uh, the first section, you might say, the prima secundae, we could call it a kind of anthropology, right? Uh, it's who is the human? If you read the prologue to the, the prima secundae, the whole point is to understand the human person as in the image of God and destined for beatitude. That's the point of the prima secundae, according to the prologue. Now, building on that, the secunda secundae, the second part of the second part, um, that deals more with the more specific character of individual human acts themselves. What are human acts? What are their categories? How do we understand them and describe them? And now a human act, in this sense, is a specific type of act which reflects in a special and, and um, definable way the, um, the nature of, uh, of humanity itself. So it's, we do lots of things that other animals do, right? Um, uh, some of those can be human acts too. Uh, we also do other things that we're not in control of, like digesting food or something like that. It's just, it's an act, but it's not an act that really um, reflects the full rational capacity of our nature. And so reason really is the key to understanding human acts. Human acts are rational. Um, and because they're rational, they also reflect um, the imprint of the imago Dei on us. So rationality doesn't have to be rationalism in this sense. Rationality is Trinitarian for Aquinas, and that he's building on St. Augustine and, and many others, and particularly Augustine's De Trinitate and the City of God. Um, and you can see it right in that, that joint that connects the, um, the secunda pars to the, the prima pars, that is the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of God that's, that's contained in the first part. When he moves to talk about the human person, the first thing he says is image. Um, how is the image of all of that <laughs> that we just said about God, how is that reflected in man? And what will that mean for his activity? So the, the second part of the second part, if you follow me, the, so the secunda secunde, which is the part where he talks about religion and sacrifice as human acts, that part contains within it, um, by implication, a kind of beatified teleology. There's plenty of nature going on there too. Uh, but Aquinas' end game, if you will, is to help us understand how we are to behave once we know that we're made in the image of God in a way that will prepare us to receive the incarnation, which he's going to talk about in the next section of the Summa. So, okay, so human acts are rational, and they're moral because they're rational, right? Um, and to be rational in this sense means not only um, uh, a sort of rationalism, but it really means ultimately to be Trinitarian and increasingly Trinitarian and our outlook and our perspective and our understanding of the significance of who we are and what we're up to, what we're doing, um, even in the most, the, the sort of smallest, the most fine-grained aspects of our life and our activity. So one way to think about this is in um, the order of virtue. So briefly put, virtue is a, um, a capacity to act in a certain way. Um, there are acts themselves and they reflect or, or sort of grow out of, emerge from, or elicited from the habit of virtue. Um, virtue can be said in many senses, and we won't go through all of them here, but religion falls under the cardinal virtues for Aquinas. So it's a, in a special way, it's a potential part of the virtue of justice. Okay. Uh, and then sacrifice is an act of that virtue. So we don't have time to go into all of the fine-grained detail you can find in Aquinas. I mean, you, you can find hours of material in the Secunda Secunda if you want on this subject. But for our purposes here, it's just important to notice that, one, religion is an act of justice. Religion itself is one of the most basic features of our anthropology. You don't need revelation to have an inclination to religion in this sense. Uh, it's a basic feature of who we are as human persons, which gets caught up in the life of grace and the new law of love, for sure. But in its most basic form, uh, it's a feature um, of the virtue of justice, and it's a potential part, which means that, um, simply put, justice is justice whether or not religion is operative. But religion has the capacity to be caught up into the purpose of justice. Justice orders us towards, in, in a right relationship with God and our neighbor. Now, right there, you can see the beginnings, the allegorical beginnings, of what Aquinas will describe charity as. Charity, again, is a, is a relationship of love with God and our neighbor, made possible by grace. So justice is an important anthropological root for understanding what's happening to us as we become members of the body of Christ and capable of Christian worship. Okay, um, so religion is an 
uh, is a subspecies, if you will, of the virtue of justice, just a more specific form of justice. Um, and sacrifice is, is an act of the virtue of religion. There are a number of acts of religion, which we won't cover here uh, for the sake of brevity. But um, what's important to recognize is that all acts are either internal or external. Right? So you can speak about a human act as either an external human act or an internal human act. When I formulate an intention, when I decide for myself in my mind uh, about something one way or another, I can, I can perform internal acts all the time. When I solve a math problem or read Aquinas and think about what it means. I mean, I'm not doing anything physically to speak of, but I'm, I am acting, uh, and I'm acting in a way that fulfills my nature. We can also act externally, and that's a bit more obvious, right? Uh, I, can, I can touch this podium, I can wave my hand, I can do all sorts of other things that are physical acts. And so the, the moral dimension of our life as human persons made in the image of God embraces both those internal and external realities. And the language of virtue in all of its specificity um, and all of its distinctions has ways of speaking about the, the interrelationship between our interior and our exterior life. Sacrifice as an act of the virtue of religion can embrace both of those. In, when the term sacrifice is used more loosely, it refers to both. Um, and that's a biblical reference. It is, it's in the Psalms, it's uh, all over the Old Testament, and in the history of the church. It's a sacrifice of the heart, right? And Aquinas will use that terminology as well. Um, but most specifically in the Secunda Secunde, Aquinas is going to say that sacrifice is an external act of the virtue of religion. Um, and what distinguishes it from other acts is that something gets changed. Something gets changed. Um, let me say a little bit more about what that means. So without going into all the details of all the other acts of the virtue of religion, um, there are other ways in which we can express religiosity other than sacrifice. Devotion of the heart, for instance. Uh, adoration, acts of adoration that you might perform, um, that you might sort of incline your body in a certain way in prayer. Those are all external acts of religion. Devotion is an internal act. Sacrifice, at least in its most specific and proper form, is an external act which is different from other oblations or offerings. You can offer things all the time. Uh, any, you can offer all sorts of things to God. Um, but something gets changed in a sacrifice, changed or consumed, Aquinas will say. So here again, he's already, even though this could be said of natural or supernatural acts of sacrifice, this sort of definition. He's already laying the groundwork uh, to talk about the Eucharist as, as bread which is consumed, right? Um, bread which is broken, blessed, and consumed. And that, uh, it's important to see there, you sort of the seeds of the, the sort of unfolding, what I called before a sort of beatified anthropology at work in the Secunda Pars, right? That um, although Aquinas is talking about nature, <laughs> Uh, his end game is the life of grace. Uh, and so when we turn to look at the Eucharist, we'll see that especially, that the, the moral life itself is being caught up in the sacramental economy, and that the perfection of Christ's human nature, united to his divine nature, that that allows us to participate in that perfection in, in a way which opens up the life of grace to us and communion with the living God. So, okay, I think... Um, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to say about um, law and anthropology, but I think for the interest of time, we should probably take a look at uh, the Tertia Pars itself and the significance of, um, of Christ's passion here. So when we look, um, we can make a few distinctions when we look at the Tertia Pars. And um, the, first, the first idea, before we even talk about the passion, will be the instrumentality of Christ's humanity. Now, um, when you use an instrument, it becomes a kind of extension of your body. So Aristotle will talk about um, sort of uh, external instruments like a tool or a shovel or something like that you pick up. Aquinas, filtered through the Eastern Greek fathers, will, will pick up on this as a Christological analogy for the way in which Christ's humanity is related to his divinity, and then further how the sacraments get related to the incarnation. So the humanity of Christ is an intrinsic instrument of his divinity, the sacraments are extrinsic instruments. And the, uh, the analogy works in the following way, that if my body, if you will, right, is an intrinsic instrument of my soul, uh, my soul calls the shots, decides what to do, uh, my body follows suit. Uh, but it's connected to me, it's intrinsic. I, I wouldn't be a human person without it, right? Uh, so 
but that's different from a shovel or a rake that I would pick up in my hand. Uh, with or without the tool, I'd be just as much myself. So it's not intrinsic to my nature. Um, but in the sacramental economy, you see all sorts of fi instruments becoming joined to the humanity of Christ and functioning as instruments which communicate the power of his divinity. Water, bread, wine, oil, all sorts of things of that kind are united to Christ instrumentally uh, as instruments of his priesthood and his sacrifice. So when we look at Christ's passion in the Tertia of Pars, and you can find this in question 22 of the Tertia of Pars, just on the, on the passion itself, and that's really the sort of, emo, you might even say the sort of emotional experience of Christ on the cross, although that's more of a modern category, right? Um, but uh, the way in which Christ's suffering was experienced. Um, Aquinas is, makes actually quite a bit out of the, um, the speculative intellect of Christ and the way in which joy and sorrow are mingled together for him. Um, the importance of this, just in terms of the virtue of religion, is to notice that religion itself, if we go back to the Secunda Pars, is a kind of raising of the mind to God, right? A, a raising of the mind to God. And so we can see Christ on the cross in his humanity, uh, performing a kind of perfect act of the virtue of religion. Um, so it's important for Aquinas just to see that uh, Christ is the exemplar of the beatified anthropology that he's proposing to us in the Summa Theologiae. Now, the sacrifice that Christ offers um, on the cross, now obviously the, it's connected to the passion, but when we shift to say sacrifice, we're now talking about the specific act that Christ is performing, right? Um, so using some texts from uh, Augustine's De Trinitate, um, Aquinas makes a, a distinction here between uh, the way in which an offering can be spoken. So um, Augustine proposes that a sacrifice, and this is in his book on the Trinity, right? Augustine proposes that a sacrifice can be considered in four ways, distinguishing between the recipient of the offering, the one who offers, that which is offered, and for whom it is offered. So in question 22 of the Tertia Pars, Aquinas argues uh, that as both priest and victim, because Christ is both in this case, uh, Christ himself fulfills all four of these aspects of sacrifice. So again, those aspects are um, the recipient of the offering, the one who offers, that which is offered, and for whom it is offered. So because Christ in his body represents all of us, right, um, we participate in his humanity in the life of grace. So we're members of his body. When we take Christ in the, in the ecclesial sense, when we have an, an ecclesial understanding of his humanity, we can see how his offering, his one single offering on the cross, is perfective of that full, fourfold Augustinian understanding of sacrifice itself. This is important, again, when we look, when we understand Christ as a kind of allegorical fulfillment of the old law, it's important for Aquinas that Christ's sacrifice is the most perfect of all sacrifices, so that it can stand as an exemplar for all other sacrifices. Um, that allows the multitude of lesser sacrifices which are repeated daily or yearly in the Old Testament to be simply foreshadowings of the fullness that is to come. So for, for Aquinas, Christ's exemplarity on the cross stands as the, not only the fulfillment and consummation of the Old Testament, but the beginning of something new. So when we turn to look at the Eucharist itself, um, we can see the way in which Christ is present there. Um, we know, of course, that Christ is truly present or really present in the Eucharist. Um, but when we ask the question of sacrifice, how is Christ's sacrifice present in the Eucharist? Um, Aquinas has a bit more to say. Um, in one sense, it's present as a, a sign. Um, so you can think of the, uh, the Eucharist as a sign um, of the cross, right? So that when we call the, the Eucharist a sacrifice, in one sense, we're saying, we're gesturing towards that singular event on Calvary, right? And saying that this this is a sign of that. But there's another sense in which it's an effect, right? So it actually communicates uh, the effects. Um, one difference here that Aquinas will draw out, you can, say, um, you can say that something is present by sign when you look at a picture or an image. So if you see a picture of Cicero or something like that, right? Um, you could say that Cicero is present by sign. 
Um, so Aquinas is careful to say that that is true of the Eucharist, certainly, but there's also more to be said about the Eucharist, um, and that the effect, uh, the effect of the passion itself is being applied, or rather the recipients of the Eucharist, those members of the body, which are in a certain sense present in the sacrifice itself, right? they're gathered into that one offering, and so they receive the effect. They don't just watch, right? Uh, they don't just watch the events unfold, but by being gathered into the body of Christ, by consuming the, the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ, that saving sacrifice is applied to us, in a sense, and, and it's presence within our hearts and our souls is renewed and strengthened. Um, just one more thought before, um, before I wrap up here. Um, when we look at the, uh, the priesthood of Jesus Christ in relation to the individual believer, so we've already seen how Christ is present in the old law and how that builds, um, or rather sets the stage for the fulfillment of the new law, and how also there are an awful lot of anthropological ideas, that is, ideas about the human person, both according to human nature, but then also according to the, the possibilities that lie before the human person in the order of grace, that Aquinas uses as building blocks also when he talks about the humanity of Christ and our humanity as well, when we allow our own religiosity to be caught up in the sacramental life of the church. Um, when we look at the way in which the priesthood of Christ is present in us, though, we can say even a little bit more. Um, and one way to do that is to just draw a distinction between sanctifying grace itself and an idea called sacramental character. Um, sacramental character is, a, it's, if you're familiar with the catechism, you may know the, the phrase that it's an indelible mark on the soul. You know, it's, a, it's a mark left by Christ. It can't be erased. And there are three sacraments that give it. Uh, or give different characters, but character nonetheless. So baptism, uh, confirmation, and holy orders. But focusing specifically on the sacrament of baptism, Christ, um, or Aquinas rather, is going to say that um, the sacramental character is a participation in the perfection of Christ's priesthood, an instrumental participation in the perfection of Christ's priesthood. So I'm not perfect. My humanity's not perfect. My life and grace, we're all working on it, right? <laughs> Uh, it's destined to perfection and charity, but most of us are somewhere along the road. Uh, but m that mark, that indelible mark within us for Aquinas is the presence by instrumental power. Now, in the same way that the stick is in the hand, uh, in the same way that, that the humanity of Christ, if you will, takes up the water of baptism, that by instrumental power, right, um, the perfection and fullness of Christ's priesthood is marked in us, right? Um, and that enables us to participate fruitfully in the liturgy. Uh, it enables us to worship rightly. It allows the virtue of religion, that basic anthropological capacity, to flourish in the supernatural life of grace in a way which gives us life in, in this life and in the next. So on that note, I'd like to conclude and um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Father Reginald. It's a fascinating lecture. Um, our first question uh, will come from John Brackett on Zoom. Um, John asks, you said the literal sense anchors the different spiritual allegorical senses of a text. Um, could you expand on that and explain how the literal sense anchors the spiritual ones? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, th thank you for that. Um, so at least for Aquinas, now you'll get a little bit of variation in, in different church fathers uh, uh, you know, throughout the history of the church in the way in which they relate the literal and the spiritual senses of Scripture. But at least for Aquinas, um, the literal sense is a kind of check on um, more imaginative spiritual <laughs> interpretations, right? Um, and the example that Aquinas will give uh, is, um, the, we'll take the example of fire. That's one of the examples he gives. Now, Fire is all over the place in the Bible. You can find all kinds of references to fire. Uh, does it signify the Holy Spirit or the devil? Uh, potentially both, right? It would really depend on context. And um, in order to have a definitive sense of what Scripture means, you need to anchor uh, spiritual interpretations of a text in the literal sense of Scripture as a whole. And, and so more specifically, what I mean by that, what Aquinas is going to mean is that the um, the all the doctrines of the church can be found in the literal sense of Scripture, right? Um, and if you have a spiritual interpretation, 
it should be found elsewhere in the, in the literal sense of Scripture, if that makes sense, right? Uh, so um, you could even have a, a multiplicity of literal senses in a single text. That could be okay as long as doctrinally what you're saying about each one of those spiritual levels of interpretation squares with what we know from the literal sense of revelation somewhere else. Um, and that type of litmus test, I, I think, you know, it's a, a, a middle-of-the-road approach to uh, the senses of Scripture. Um, some, some of the church fathers who were far more reliant on allegory uh, really saw um, spiritual interpretation as the only way to fully understand the meaning of the text. And I, I think in Aquinas you see something just a little bit more moderate than that. Um, so if that, that answers your question or not. But. Our next question comes from Zoom. Um, Dean Menezes uh, from UCLA has a question. Uh, Dean, please go ahead. Uh, in St. Thomas's ranking of the uh, four cardinal virtues, he puts justice second, but uh, it seems that uh, since piety is a part of justice and the sacraments are a very, uh, they're a very significant part of our spiritual life and, and religion uh, to be of supreme importance, uh, it seems like justice should be uh, more, more the most important <laughs> virtue. Why is that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think um, part of the risk of uh, um, anytime you focus on a theme in Aquinas, right, which I've done here, you know, I've created a talk about a theme, uh, you, there's a lot of other parts of his thought that you just don't talk about, right, because <laughs> to study the entire Summa would take um, more time than we have this evening, right? But um, that being said, um, so justice is uh, a, a fundamental part of who we are, but um, it's, uh, it's true, right? Uh, so the, uh, the cardinal virtues, and even then there's the, the intellectual virtues too, right? I mean, you have a, there is a hierarchy for Aquinas. So I think one way to approach it might be to think about the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, um, and their relationship to the intellect and intellectual virtues and the perfection of our understanding and our loving, right, our, our, our will to love our neighbor and God, as um, the sort of the way in which justice as, a, as an ordering, if you will, of the, um, of the soul towards the higher purposes of reason and towards our obligations, right, as a communal person towards God and our neighbor, the way in which justice begins to make sense, if you will, in the, in the larger scope of the spiritual life. So I, I think one way to think about it would be just to think about, first and foremost, the primacy of of faith, hope, and charity, right? And charity itself for Aquinas is the form of all the virtues. Um, and everything, including natural virtues, uh, acquired natural virtue, can be caught up, as it were, in the higher purposes of our participation in divine love. So um, Aquinas is able to speak about more specific virtues, and that might be a, a key to understanding it. When, it. when he has a hierarchy or a ranking, sometimes he just means things are more specific. <laughs> Um, uh, and they, they refer to something more specific or more practical than pure intellectual rationality or something like that. And there's an awful lot about who we are and what we do that, um, that is it a certain arm's length, right, um, from, from the, um, the speculative intellect. And here, you know, it might be helpful, too, just to think about the difference between the speculative and the practical intellect, right? So um, the speculative intellect is where you think about the, the big ideas, right? No practical skills or, or, or decisions involved. Uh, you think about, oh, you know, the Christology according to Aquinas, or math or something like that, right? Or music also, uh, the conceptual dimension of music. Um, but the practical intellect is what decides how things are gonna get done in the real world, right? <laughs> um, and um, it is lower, right, than the speculative intellect, but no less important and no less human. Um, so what Aquinas is providing for us here, um, and it is true, you, you might be tempted to say, well, you know, really religion should be just about charity. It should just be about the highest part. Uh, now, um, the whole of our divinization and life in Christ definitely is, but as an act uh, of moral virtue, religion allows us to speak about the corporality, if you will, particularly in its external acts, um, the significance of things like genuflection at Mass, right, the significance of the the communal gestures we perform in the liturgy, the significance of going to a physical space uh, 
to pray with other people rather than just thinking about it by myself or something, you know. Um, so there are lots of aspects of human life that those you know, sorts of lower virtues or lower parts of the soul, if you will, capture and tap into that are um, equally humanizing, right? We can't do without them. Um, and so it's not necessarily a slight <laughs> um, to, to think of religion in relation to justice. Um, it, it captures a certain dimension of human activity, uh, which itself, of course, has to be appreciated against the full scope of, of Aquinas's real anthropology of grace, uh, which, as I mentioned, includes the primacy of faith, hope, and love. So, yeah. Our next question comes from Anselm Lefebvre. Uh, he's a Temiscan Institute student at the University of Oregon. Um, Anselm, please go ahead. Hi, Father. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if um, sight or, or place is also a kind of a, a vital element of sacrifice or how that plays into it. Um, and then kind of in a related uh, question, how to think about um, Christ himself as an altar or a temple in relation to the Jewish temple, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe what the implications of that are for Christian temples or Christian mm -hmm. altars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great, yeah. Um, I think in terms of, of sight, uh, you mentioned sight and uh, physical space, right? Um, and... Um, so the, um, so, okay, so let's see. So sight refers to, um, sight itself isn't a virtue, right? So when Aquinas is talking about virtue, he's talking about moral acts. Um, the, the organ of sight or the, the capacity for sight, right? Um, is, uh, it's a human capacity of perfection, right? So uh, it gives us access to the world around us, obviously. Um, but it's also, at least for Aristotle and Aquinas, it's, it's one of the, at least all the senses are, the primary ways in which we access the, um, the contents of the natural world and, and on a practical level begin to think first about what's most particular and then what's most eternal. So um, there's a, a progression there, at least in our uh, ordinary experience, between contact with particular physical things and the... Um, the bigger ideas or the formal concepts that they might represent. Um, so um, if you think about the difference between um, uh, human nature and this man or Socrates, right? Um, the particularity of Socrates or when we say this cat as opposed to that one, um, we can't physically experience the idea uh, of human nature, right? Or the idea of catness or something, right? Um, but most of what we know about it is drawn from sensory experience, right? Uh, if, when you go to define what a cat is, you'd probably start listing off physical qualities, right? Um, and you get a whole list together, and then you sort of circumscribe the essence, right, of what makes it a cat and not a dog, right, or whatever. Um, the, the point of all this, right, is just to say that um, unlike other, other types of rational beings, like angels, for instance, although even they have a... It's complicated. That's another, that's another lecture, Aquinas' angelology. They, they have, they're not without relation to space. Um, but uh, we really need it. You know? uh, the, we really need space. Uh, and we need to see and touch things. right? Um, and we need that not because those things are ends in and of themselves, but because they lead us to higher things. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to organize the, the space in which we worship as best we can according to our means in a way which leads us to the things that are most important, the most eternal things. Helps us to cross the divide between the, uh, the external spaces of the temple and the interior one. Uh, it helps us to access the eternal truths of God's love, of who Jesus Christ is. And the idea that we can do that effectively without <laughs> um, the external aid uh, of liturgy, for instance, right, uh, or liturgical space is, um, is dehumanizing quite frankly, <laughs> um, and won't work. Uh, we need the liturgy, we need each other, uh, and we need the church as the body of Christ to be somewhere and to look like something and to, to do all those things in a way that we ourselves are drawn beyond the, the physicality of it uh, and into the mystery itself. Um, and I th you mentioned also the humanity of Christ as an altar. Um, that's a really rich idea, and I, I wish we could, we could probably spend another hour just talking about that, because it has, it really, um, 
it means that you and I can become an altar also, right? Again, not, not by any power of ours, certainly not, um, but because of Christ's, um, because of the presence of sanctifying grace, but also the, the priesthood of Christ present within us uh, instrumentally, right? Uh, because of that presence within us, we are able through him and in him, right, uh, to, um, to live and act in a way which is Christological. And um, so Christ's humanity um, and the, the, the incarnational union of his humanity as divinity makes an altar out of the, the clay of human nature. And he's trying to do the same thing with us in grace. And when sanctifying grace runs its course, it begins as a, um, a sort of, a, he calls it an essential accident. And it's in hearing in the essence of the soul, um, which um, if you know anything about Aristotle's metaphysics should disturb you. Uh, it's a radical claim. Uh, it's a radical claim. It means that human nature itself, at its deepest core, is being divinized. Right? And that's why Aquinas will say that sanctifying grace is nothing other than a participation in divine nature, right? full stop. Um, and where it ends, if you will, or it's, it's telos, right? it, it's, um, its end game, is the perfection of charity. And because perfection is related to eternal things, you never really reach the end of it. You just keep going and going and going. Until finally, God willing, we end up in heaven and we can just worship all the time. Um, so, um, that answers your question. Thank you. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Ronaldo Reyes uh, on Zoom. Um, he asks, can the online uh, live streaming of the Mass substitute the actual yeah. celebration of the Eucharist? So, in other words, does the virtual participation in the Mass emit the same sacramental grace during uh, spiritual communion? Ah, okay. This is a um, prescient question, right? In, in today's um, today's experience, uh, certainly the, these um, these times are unprecedented in, in recent church history. Even if you go back to the, the Middle Ages, there there's um, it's a singular experience and a, a singular ecclesial experience, I, I think, for us all. And um, I think we've all experienced it in different ways, right? The sort of um, distance from the sacraments. Right um, as a real poverty, um, and uh, even even for a priest, even though I mean I can say even though I can celebrate the sacraments for myself, thankfully, uh, or with other priests, the absence of the laity is its own poverty, right? Um, because the 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 priesthood, the ordained priesthood, there's a different sacramental character involved there, right? Uh, than the the character of baptism it builds on it, but it's meant to serve uh, the laity, right? That's what it's for. It's meant to dispense the sacraments. It's meant to be. Um, you know, the, take the, the role in certain contexts of Christ as head of the church. Um, so it is, uh, it is, it's disruptive, to say the least, and that's just at the level of experience. And um, I think that acknowledging that can draw us more deeply into our own, our own need, you know, for the corporality, if you will, of the sacraments. That is that um, uh, <laughs> we, we need, <laughs> we need the sacramental signs, we, we need the liturgy, we need to receive the Eucharist, actually receive the Eucharist. Um, you know, that being said, spiritual communion, um, when we're prevented from receiving through no fault of our own, um, is, uh, is effective and alive for us. So don't underestimate the power of spiritual communion, um, especially when, obviously, in these circumstances, it's through no fault of our own that we've been separated from the Holy Mass. Um, another thing to think about, and Aquinas will quote this at some points, an idea from Augustine, that uh, the sacraments are effective, right? And Aquinas will say they're causes, they're efficient causes of grace. But Augustine will also say that God is not shackled or bound by the sacraments. That is to say, there's all sorts of what we could call sort of free-floating or <laughs> extraordinary graces that Aquinas will refer to. There's all sorts of other ways in which God is operative in the world and operative in your life. And that's not to discount the sacraments at all. That's uh, my last, furthest thing from my mind. But um. It can heighten our awareness also, right, of the, the fact that God is not constrained by the constraints that have been imposed on us. Uh, and I think, I think we can take some hope from that and uh, also allow it to rekindle our desire for the Eucharist and to return as, as soon as possible. So. Um, Matthew Antero asks from YouTube, how is the cardinal virtue of justice, in which religion is an integral part, transformed through the law of grace? Okay. How is justice transformed through grace? Yeah. Um, 
Well, one way, one thing to think about, uh, I touched a little bit on the idea of law, right? Um, and uh, I, I said that law could either be an external precept or an interior, um, an interior principle or a ratio, right? So that reason itself as the defining characteristic of human nature is a kind of ratio or law of the human person. Um, okay, and the reason I mention that is because when God creates being, when he creates created being, he's also acting as a kind of lawgiver, right? Uh, so when he creates, he gives law, or he gives ratio, he gives purpose, um, he gives interior intelligibility. Um, it's why we are something and not something else, <laughs> why we're not cats and we're, we're human persons, we're what we are. Um, you know, we have a ratio to us. When he recreates us in grace, right, um, there's another kind of law giving, if you will, which can be formulated in external precepts, but before it's formulated externally, it's already an internal law of the heart, right? And um, Aquinas will use that, that sense of the law of the heart. Um, you see it in the letter to the Hebrews and elsewhere in the Bible, right? Uh, it's in the Psalms. Um, it's a way of talking about charity. And that, too, he's building on Augustine in a lot of ways. So the point here uh, that I think um, it's helpful to see, what you wouldn't want to do is think of grace and nature as a kind of two-tiered system or something, right? You've got nature, and then you've just got this, I don't know, grace is a sort of external or extrinsic imposition. Um, they are distinct, and Aquinas easily and freely speaks about them as distinct realities. But because uh, the nice thing about the scholastic method is you can make distinctions without dividing things. Uh, you can be precise with your distinctions. And even within the unity of a nature, you can make distinctions which actually help us understand the final purpose and unity of the, of the whole more clearly uh, rather than introducing division. So the law of grace in this sense um, functions as a kind of elevation of nature. That's one way to think about it. So if you look at question 109 in the Prima Secunde, he's going to talk about two different types of ends. And I touched on this a little bit earlier. So one is according to nature, that's proportionate to our nature. So there's a sense in which human nature has proportionate ends and proportionate perfections. So when we're perfected in justice according to the natural sense, um, Aquinas means, broadly speaking, something similar to what Aristotle and Cicero will say about the, the cardinal virtue of justice as well. Um, and some of the themes you'll find in those classical authors, right, is that justice is a, um, it's an ordering of the person to the common good. You know, um, it's something which orders us to the good of society uh, as a whole. And it speaks to the social characteristic, right, of, um, of the human person. And therefore, it's perfected really as a relation, right? It's not so much an, an intrinsic potency as such, uh, whereas um, when charity perfects the will, for instance, right, it really is it's perfecting my will, right, not, not some sort of free-floating social sense of will, al although it's an ecclesial principle, it's certainly connected to my life in the church, um, when I'm caught up in, in charity, it's really it's my the powers of my soul that are being perfected, right? Uh, as a relation to the other, right? You know, justice has this capacity to set us in right relation, right? Um, in the order of charity, um, you see this being perfected, right? As a as a kind of supernatural elevation, um, and again, it's not an external imposition but the capacities of the person, him or herself, are being supernaturally extended, you might say. And so what's intrinsically possible for us is now just framed against a much wider horizon, which includes beatitude. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, and, and so again, Aquinas will talk about a proportionate end and then an ultimate end, which is disproportionate. <laughs> and what he means by that, this is again from question 109 in the Prima Secunde, the proportionate end is the end of nature, and that's what we mean. Justice is one of those ends, right? Um, but in the uh, our ultimate end is actually disproportionate, uh, which is a funny situation to be in. It means that there's something about us which is made for something that we can't seem to attain, uh, at least not without help. And gratia, the, the word itself, is sometimes even translated as aid or assistance. Uh, so God's auxilium or his aid, uh, his help, um, is the, the way in which, once we've been transformed in sanctifying grace, once we've, we've been sort of qualitatively changed in, our, in the essence of our souls, um, we're sort of shepherded towards beatitude by God's motion and his action in our lives. Um, 
that might be kind of a long-winded <laughs> explanation, um, but uh, I think that um, when we think about justice in those categories, we can think about it in different ways. So justice in what sense, right? Uh, justice in a social or cultural sense, we can talk about that at least, uh, at least in some sense without reference to Christianity, um, without reference to the virtue of religion in its supernatural sense, in its Christological sense. But when we say justice in the full sense, in the ultimate sense, uh, we're really talking about reconciling the rift of original sin itself, uh, because that's, it's, it's an injustice, right? Um, and again, if justice is about relation, um, the injustice is a measure of the separation or the alienation as much as, as much as it is a sort of name for the crime that was committed, right? Um, uh, so it's a restoration of communion. It's a restoration of, of relation with God and neighbor in the full sense. And when it's measured against the, the sort of eschatological finality of charity, against the law of love, it takes on a supernatural characteristic, a supernatural quality, which is perfective of, of us intrinsically. So it's not an external imposition, but it is something we need help with. Uh, and uh, thankfully, we have um, our participation in the body of Christ to, to work that change within us.